Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and I'm so excited. We have Mark Sisson of Mark's Daily Apple, and I love, love, love this website. It's absolutely amazing. I love everything that Mark does. We are just so in alignment with everything, and so I'm more than excited to have you on the show. So Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me, Chateau. This, this is great. Yeah. So first thing I want to talk about, which is kind of all the rage that people are talking about, is just being metabolically flexible. And I want you to kind of talk about what that means and what you've incorporated in your life to kind of get you to be more more flexible. Uh, great question. So metabolic flexibility describes a condition of the body, a state of the body, where you are able to extract energy from whatever substrate is needed and available at the time. So if you're doing glycolytic work in the gym, then your body is able to burn glucose and glycogen. If you're doing long steady state aerobic stuff, your body is able to burn fats. Um, if you are just uh, walking around living your life and not doing any sort of activity at all, you're burning mostly fats. The ability of the body to, to, to derive energy from these sources is built into our genes. We are born with this ability. Unfortunately, over the course of a lifetime, many of us lose the ability to burn fat. And that's obviously problematic for a lot of people. It turns out most people apparently in this country, um, some 80% of us are overweight now, 40% are, are obese. This is a result of not having become metabolically flexible enough to burn off the stored body fat. So metabolic flexibility is the ideal human condition. If you are metabolically flexible, you can go long periods of time without eating anything because your body knows how to take energy from the stored body fat, transport it into the muscles, burn it, combust it, as we say, um, have you go about your day. If you're doing really hard work, real fast, quick work, you can uh, derive energy from the glycogen stored in your muscles. If you are without a source of carbohydrate for long periods of time, your brain becomes very adept at burning ketones. In fact, the brain prefers ketones as a fuel source over glucose. Uh, but again, if you haven't trained your body through diet and to a certain extent through exercise, if you haven't trained your body to become metabolically flexible, you are so dependent on carbohydrates all the time. You're dependent on a meal every two or three hours. Your blood sugar you know, rises as a result of the meal. Then your insulin levels uh, increase and try to extract all that, that glucose, take it out of the bloodstream and store it in, in muscle cells. And if the muscle cells are full, it tries to store it in fat cells. Uh, and and that that idea that then you've reduced all the glucose in the bloodstream, now you get hungry two hours later, so you have to eat again, and this continues this cycle. As you continue to raise insulin, insulin is, as a fat storage hormone, it also locks fat into the cells. So you can't even access the energy that's stored in the fat cells if you have high insulin levels all the time, which you get from eating many multiple meals. So when you become metabolically flexible, um, you you sort of are able to go through the day without depending on a lot of extra calories every couple of hours. You can go long, long periods of time without eating, never feel negative effects, never feel you know uh, hangry or or with a low blood sugar as, as a result of that. It is the most empowering, uh, I think, state of the human body is to be metabolically flexible. It is the holy grail of all ways of eating. Now, you ask, how do I achieve that for myself? Well, I do it through two ways primarily. I'm keto-ish in my diet, which means I'm um, I'm mostly uh, protein sort of focused, protein centric, and then I top that off with some amount of healthy fats. I don't look for carbohydrates, but I don't avoid them necessarily. I mean, if I'm, I'll eat uh, you know a salad uh, with some protein on top for lunch. I'll have a, a steak for dinner with uh, steamed vegetables or something like that. I might even have a half of a sweet potato or something like that, a little bit of carbs. I don't I don't aggressively try to cut my carbs to a below keto level. On the other hand, I only eat twice a day. So I have this 16 to 18 hour eating window. And during those 16 to 18 hours, when I'm not eating, that's the body receiving the signals that there's not going to be any glucose. So let's start burning fat. Let's burn fat more efficiently. Let's create more mitochondria, which is where the fat burns inside the cells. Let's make those mitochondria more efficient. Let's build a machinery to burn ketones in the brain so that whenever we don't have access to external calories, we're fine. We're not only fine, we're better off as a result of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's so good. 
And it's funny because the other day I came home, it was five o'clock and my husband was like, I said, I'm starving. And he was like, I said, I haven't eaten anything all day. And I didn't intentionally fast. I was just literally that busy. And I didn't even realize that. I said, I literally just had water and, you know, tea all day. And he said to me, he was, we were talking about it. And I said, you know, I love that I'm finally at a point in life where instead of me trying to figure out what's the most amount of food that I can eat and not gain weight, I'm literally like, what's the least amount of food that I can eat, still have energy because I was fine all day and, you know, still can have the muscle mass that I want and not be constantly like thinking about what's the most I can eat, but literally like, I'm not hungry, I'm fine, and I have to worry about this is the least amount that I can eat, and I'm still okay and not like dying of hunger. Yeah, no, I mean, I think people go through that through life um, sort of with that idea that they're always trying to guess, um, you know, I would suppose I, uh, most I could eat, not gain weight, uh, not feel like a, a glutton, not feel like a slob, not, not be uncomfortable because I ate so much, such a big, big dinner. Um, and when you get to that point where you are willing to experiment and see that, again, what's the least amount of food you can eat, maintain muscle mass, have all the energy you want, most not get sick, and most importantly, not be hungry. Because if you get hungry, it ruins the whole thing. So it's not like you're trying to have this game with yourself, this contest to see what's the least amount of food you can eat, full stop. It's what's the least amount of food I can eat and live my life to the fullest and not be hungry. Uh, and what people realize is that. Um, if you play this game, if you if you try this experiment, you'll realize you're probably eating 35% more calories than you really need to eat to thrive. Now, some people can get away with that. Some people can not gain weight. Some people, you know, feel, I guess, fine. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on under the surface. There's a lot of, like, if you eat a thousand extra calories a day for a few weeks, for instance, you might not even gain weight, but your body will rev at a higher level. It'll try to be, it'll literally be, hotter trying to burn off those extra calories that it knows it doesn't need. Is that a good thing? Probably not in my book, but you know, some some people would say, oh, I want a fast metabolism. I want to rev high. I want to, I want to be, you know, able to eat all the things that I can eat. But as you and I have agreed, if you can get to that point where you're comfortable uh, and satiated on less food, that's kind of the ideal place to be. Provided again that you have protein uh, your your protein requirements met. And then from there, everything sort of falls into place. So tell us the kind of a day in the life of Mark. What what do you, how do you start your day? Kind of some of the different hacks that you do and what what does your eating look like? Give us a typical day. Yeah. I mean, I get up um, and I have a cup of coffee and I do, um, I do a lot of mental work at the beginning of the day. So I do, you know, I have this list of puzzles that I that I do, whether it's New York Times, crossword, Sudoku, um, spelling bee, uh, there's a, you know, uh, there's a jumble, there's a, a number of puzzles I do. I try, I like eight of them. I try to get done within, say, a uh, half an hour period, sometimes a 40 minute period. And that's just kind of my fun way to start off a day and get the, get the brain churning just on a cup of coffee. Um, I'll do some work after that. And then I go to the gym around 10, anywhere from 10 and up to 11 o'clock and I spent an hour to an hour and a half doing something. Today I went for a, a bike ride on the sand. I have a fat bike that I ride on the sand. Um, and that's one of my weekly sort of aerobic uh, workouts. And I also do a stand-up paddling. But then in the gym, I do a sort of concentrated two days a week of upper, upper body training. I always do my training fasted. I never eat before I train. And not out of any sort of desire to lose weight or burn off any additional fat. Just I'm not hungry before I do a workout, and I get through my workout quite nicely. As long as the workout doesn't exceed, say, an hour and a half, I know that I have all the glycogen I need in my muscles to even do hard work and 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 you know sprint work. So it's it's not an issue for me that way. Uh, around one o'clock, I'll break and have my first meal. It'll typically be lunch. Um, I just came back for lunch just now. I uh, I had a uh, a Greek salad uh, with you know olive oil and just vinegar dressing. I had uh, um, a nice piece of big piece of salmon, and then I had some a little bit of uh, rice with the salmon, some like wild rice with the salmon. Not a lot, just a, look. I I'm not carnivore, and I'm not really keto. I'm keto ish, and 
Yet, if you added up all of the carbs in that meal, it was probably you know, 35 or 40 grams of carbs total, right? So um, even though I had rice and I had, I had, you know, a nice, and I knew some spinach and some, uh, and some um, artichoke, uh, steamed artichoke hearts on this. It's a, it's a wonderful dish. And I go every Monday, that's where I go for lunch, right? So that's my, my Monday lunch is this, is this salmon meal. Um, and then I'll go the rest of the day until probably 730. Um, I'll have uh, dinner and it'll be typically it's a steak, big steak um, and some vegetables, maybe some broccoli or something like that. Um, glass of wine or two, red wine, dry farm wines, which is the, you know, the, the only wine I'll drink, which is this wine that's been tested for no sugar, lower at, and alcohol, none of the additives. I don't, are you familiar with dry farm wines? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so that, and, and it's, it, it's the most, you know, satisfying meal I could think of. There's nothing missing from these meals that I wish I had, right? I don't wish I had a basket of dinner rolls sitting in front of me. I don't wish that I had um, a giant dessert. Uh, you know, that's just, that's just how I roll. Um, and, um, yeah, and so the afternoon is typically I do a lot of podcasts in the afternoon. I do uh, a lot of writing and working on a, on a new book. Um, so a lot of the work I do between lunch and dinner is the main focus of my day. Since I've, I like to do the workout in the morning and get that kind of uh, out of the way. Mm, I love it. And I love that you said that. I'm the exact same way. I'm keto-ish. Like most of my meals are vegetables and some kind of protein. And I know that I just am a lot more satiated when I have protein. And so the more protein I have, the better I feel. And so I, but I'm, again, I'm not, I don't count, you know, exactly how many carbs I'm eating. I just make sure that most of my meals are, you know, protein and healthy vegetables that aren't with tons and tons of carbs. It's and, hard to go wrong if you focus on on that. Exactly. I don't know about you guys, but I am stressed. And if you're feeling overwhelmed this holiday season, then I get it. With all the family get-togethers, it is just a relentless source of stress. But anyway, there is something that I've got called Stress Guardian. And it's actually made by Bioptimizers, the people who make the magnesium breakthrough, which I love, love, love. But anyway, they are literally made this new product. It has 14 adaptogenic herbs and it just regulates your stress. I just actually took some right this second. And it's awesome. If you go to stressguardian.com slash waste away and put in waste away for 10% off your first order, it's stressguardian.com slash waste away. Go there now. So tell us about kind of what's helping you as far as digestion. We're having a lot of listeners that are talking about their, they feel like their digestion, they're having a lot of digestive issues. And one of the things that I think for me is that when I'm eating, when you're food combining and you're basically eating a protein and a vegetable, your body can digest that so much better than when you're adding in, you know, bread and adding all this stuff in and you're overeating, it's hard to digest. Is there anything that you're doing right now that's really helping you with your digestion and helping your gut my gut microbiome? You know, um I I addressed that years ago when I gave up grains. So for me, grains really mess with my digestion. I mean, like for a long time, for 35 years. And once I gave up grains, I realized that had been the major source of my problems. Also, um, I don't drink water with meals and um, and I do drink wine and wine has a lower pH. So one of the rationales I have for, for drinking wine with dinner is um, I don't want to interfere with the acidity of my stomach and, and the beginnings of the digestive process. And I think if you drink a lot of water with a meal, you tend to dilute a lot of what uh, of, of the digestion process. So I'm I don't drink water with meals. I, I mean, if I do, I drink a little bit of sparkling water, water which ha- does also have a lower pH. Uh, so it fits in that paradigm. I I don't I never needed digestive enzymes. I don't worry about my digestion. I mean, since I the more carnivore I lean, the better my jet digestion becomes, which is I think an interesting observation. I think uh, you know I I'm I'm a, again I think. Most people suffer more from uh, pH 
issues in their stomach than any sort of uh, enzymatic problems further on downstream. I think people who take any antacids because they think they have acid reflux, that messes with the digestion. Uh, if you drink a lot of water because you think water is good for you during a meal, that messes with digestion, uh, especially if you're a, a if you're eating a lot of vegetables. So, you know, I I wouldn't know how to address somebody's specific digestion problems other than to question them on you know what are they drinking with the meal, uh, what are their what is their normal stomach acidity, have they had acid reflux, are they eating grains? So a lot a lot of those sort of questions have to kind of get to you have to ask those to get to the bottom of it. It's funny because we went out to dinner with a, another couple and the guy had brought some Tums with him. And he's like, I've just been having terrible heartburn. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to take some Tums. And I about reached over and grabbed yeah. them. And I'm like, that is the absolute worst thing you could possibly do. I said, right now, if you've got heartburn, it actually means that your stomach acid is not where it needs to be. Your stomach right. acid is needs to be between zero and two, like battery acid, to be able to digest it. And just like he said, if you're drinking water, think about it. You're just diluting all of that acid so you can't digest your food. And then when you take those tons, what you're doing is you're actually reducing the acid in your stomach. And there's actually a little flap that if your pH in your stomach gets to be higher, that flap comes up and it actually splatters. And that's what gives you heartburn. Like, and I give them this whole dissertation that did yes. like, give me those yes. I digestive enzymes instead. And give did, he, me did, he, did he get it? Hell, I'm giving you HCL instead. Did he understand? No, he's still, oh, I went through the whole thing and he's still one of the top. I know. People are so, <laughs> it's funny. People are just so attached to, the, to their habits, to their ways. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about, I love that you are not, because there's so many people out there that are like, you know, you have to have this much protein. You have to have this exact, no more than this exact amount of carbs. Um, talk to people if they want to kind of lose that. Because like you just said, like I'm keto-ish, you know, I want to live a free life where it's not count this and count that. I just think that's not the right way to live. So give people some pointers of ways that they can not live in that dogmatic world where they're counting every carb, counting all the protein, but still um, being able to maintain the weight that they want to maintain. Well, I mean, I, I, again, if we go back to protein as the primary focus, if you just, you don't even have to count the amount of protein. It's it's really difficult to overeat on protein, right? You'd have, that's where you start counting and you go, um, all right, I need 50 grams here, 50 grams here, 50 grams here. Um, just really focus on the protein, a nice portion of protein at lunch, a nice portion of protein at dinner, maybe a protein snack, maybe a protein diff for breakfast if you're one who eats breakfast. And once you get that that part handled, and again, don't even pay attention to calories. Like you could, after the fact, you could say, okay, that was, uh, that steak was 800 calories and it was, you know, 60 grams of protein and the rest was fat. You could sort of fill in the blanks afterwards, but but only as a matter of you know, edification. Um, if you focus on protein and then, and then what I do is I, I like, for me, I like crunch, the crunch factor. So I like a salad. Like if I could be carnivore all the time, I might even choose to do that, but I like food. I like to eat too much of what's available. I don't want to exclude it from my diet. I want to include it if it makes sense. So that's like, like if I steam broccoli, I only lightly steam it. I like the crunch of broccoli. Um, I like a crunchy Brussels sprout you know, a uh, side dish. Um, I like, I like nuts. I get uh, pistachios that are sort of uh, air, air dried uh, pistachios that I put in salads. I like, for instance, I like crunch. I like cheese. So I, I just put together a meal that satisfies my palate from a list of foods that I know I'm going to benefit from. They're not, so I, I don't include uh, pasta. I mean, I don't I'll have I'll have a uh, a half a dish of gluten free pasta once in a while, right? Because again, I like it. I just but I but I I don't eat a lot of bread. I don't know. so bread, pasta, cereal, um, pies, cakes, candies, cookies, things like that. They're just off my they're off my radar. Um, I could eat a bite once in a while, but it, and and that's fine. But I don't I don't you know eat a whole slice of cake or a whole piece of whatever. It's just 
It's because I would rather choose from the positive pile over here and say, yes, tonight's going to be um, some blue cheese on top of salad with some pistachios um, and some uh, gluten-free crackers, you know, on the side and uh, steamed broccoli and a nice uh, T-bone steak. Um, I don't think in terms of uh, macros at all. I just think in terms of the food and are they are they on my list of foods that I can eat, you know, or, or my ideal list? And are they? And, and as long as they're not on the list of foods or that I that I cannot eat, I don't care. I just eat until I'm no longer hungry, not until I'm full, but until I'm no longer hungry for the next bite. That again is another another skill that I try to teach people is is to know when it's appropriate to just push the plate of food away and say either wrap this up, I'll take it home, or um, throw it away because. They don't, I, I'm not going to eat it again or, or, you know, put it in Tupperware and I'll eat it tomorrow. But know when it's okay to push the plate of food away and say, you know what? I'm no longer hungry for the next bite. There's no magic in finishing my plate. Uh, there's no reward for earning, you know, a, a dessert since I don't eat dessert. So just that, that skill of knowing when it's okay to stop eating is, is an incredible skill. And it comes again with that same thing we, we talked about earlier, which is, it, which is not so much, you know, it, uh, defining it as what's the least amount of food I can eat, but you know how how little food can I eat of this meal and be satisfied and be and get my protein requirements and then no longer be hungry and be perfectly willing to get up from the table, walk away, and know that I can eat whenever I want to because food is everywhere, but I don't have to, and I and I and I certainly don't want to leave the table bloated and full and then regretting the last ten or fifteen bites of food that I had. You guys, I'm so excited. We are doing a free masterclass for you. It's actually on nontoxicfamily.com slash masterclass. That's nontoxicfamily.com slash masterclass. And it's going to be all about how to get rid of your gut infections, how to get rid of parasites. If you have painful digestion, if you're suffering from poor sleep, if you've got constant exhaustion, massive joint pain, or skin issues, then you need to get rid of the parasites that are holding your body hostage. I'm gonna tell you right now, you're thinking, I don't have parasites, I don't have parasites. Yes, you do, I have Crystal with me. Crystal, tell them your joke. Yeah, if you have a pulse, then you have a parasite or more. And the thing about parasites is they're sneaky and even if they came back negative on a stool test that you did before, that doesn't matter, they can still be present. And so on this masterclass, we're gonna teach you all the tips and tricks that you might have heard of but didn't know how to use, like diatomaceous earth, pumpkin seed protocols, garlic and berberine and black walnut, because you can't do all of these things, but you need to select a few that work for you. So we're going to go through all of that in this masterclass. All right. And my son created a new site. It's called Non-Toxic Family. And if you're not following, go to nontoxicfamilynow.com or on Facebook, go to Non-Toxic Family. You'll see my son. He does all these great videos on how to be healthy. They're really great. And we actually put the mat free masterclass on this site. So it's nontoxicfamily.com slash masterclass and sign up for free. Look forward to seeing you guys. Well, let's switch gears and talk about working out for a little bit. I'd love to hear what your workout routine is. And, you know, he, I am in Virginia Beach and we have a lot of marathon that we have here. We have the rock and roll marathon. I mean, it has like, you know, 30,000 people that come from everywhere. We have the shamrock marathon. We have a lot of big marathons that we attract people to. And this last marathon that I was at, I was with my husband and we were cheering on someone that was running. And I looked at him and I said, I want you to look at the people who are running right now. And I'm not joking when I tell you Probably about 70 to 80% of those people that were out running were overweight. Like yeah. I was just completely floored because I haven't, I personally, I used to do uh, like half marathons. I've never done a marathon, but I used to do kind of 10Ks and 5Ks and I just don't anymore. I just felt to feel like I'm too old and I just kept getting injured all the time. Every time I did a run, I was like injured for two weeks. So I was like, forget this. But tell us what your workout routine is and kind of are you a fan of walking or running or where are you at now? Yeah. So I'm such a fan of walking. I can't even begin to tell you, but I'll but I will be yet. Um actually my new book, 
uh, which comes out in April, is called Born to Walk. And it's really, it trashes the running movement. It literally goes through the last 50 years of the running boom and rips it a new one in terms of how inappropriate it was for most people to even take up running because they, they, they don't have proper gait um, because of the amount of injuries. I mean, running has the highest injury rate, I'm just about any, even higher than pickleball um, has the highest injury rate of any sport. Um, it's a horrible way to lose weight. Most people start running because they think they're going to lose weight by running. They think they're going to burn off the calories. But to your point, you watch this marathon and you see that 70 or 80% of the people who tow the line, the starting line at a marathon are overweight. They're 20, 30, 40 pounds overweight. And despite the amount of miles that they put into training, they haven't lost the weight. So it, running is is a it's, a, it's a catabolic in the in exercise in the, in the way that it actually, it decreases muscle mass for a lot of people and increases fat mass because you go out and do this thing and you, and you burn off, say- 500 or 600 calories in a run. You get home and you're hungry. Your brain goes, we got to eat. We got to Or you're place. starving. When you get home, yes. you're starving. Yes. <laughs> so you t- people tend to overeat to compensate for the work they did. To compensate, by the way, for the trauma and the stress of the body because running is stressful. If you don't know how to run properly with a proper stride, and most like 95% of people don't know how to run with a proper stride, They're, they are what we call heel strikers, which again is, is sort of devastating on the body. Uh, so why would you run when you can walk? Walking is anabolic. Walking build, builds muscle. It's, it's, uh, it's restorative. It's rejuvenative. So people who get injured running walk to recover. Uh, I mean, walking is the best thing a human being can do. We are bipedal. We are born to walk. And the fact that we can run does not mean we should run. It's we're, We can run because our ancestors sprinted away from danger uh, toward a food source. But believe me, our ancestors didn't get out and run five kilometers a day or 10 miles a day in training because they thought it was fun or they needed to lose weight. That would have been antithetical to survival to to waste that kind of energy doing something like that. So we were not born to run. We were born to walk. So I do a lot of walking. By the way, I was a career runner. Like I was one of the top marathoners in the country. So, you know, I finished fifth U.S. National Marathon Championships in 1980. I was a runner, runner. I ran 100 miles a week for many years. I haven't run one mile in 30 years because I I find other ways. I find more fun ways to maintain fitness and to build muscle and keep my muscle on because running tends to tear muscle down. Um, So I sprint once in a while. I play ultimate frisbee, which is a very high pass, high high fast paced uh, game of you know catching and throwing a frisbee. Um, I do this fat bike on the beach. I do stand up paddling, and then I, I'm in the gym. And I, tw- I lift twice a week, full body routine. Um, and and if you do a weight training routine well enough, you should only be able to do it twice a week. Because if you are able to do it more than say three times a week, then you're not working hard enough. Your body goes, "Hey, I know how to do this. I do this every day." So there's no there's no prompting the body to get better or to change or to grow muscle. So I lift twice a week. I ride a bike once or twice a week. I paddle once a week. Um, I walk a lot in the interim. Sometimes I walk an hour, hour and a half. Sometimes I walk on the, I'm talking on the phone. That's one of the ways I multitask. If I'm having a call, I'll walk outside. Um, If I feel like I want a real hard workout and I'm walking, I'll put on either a 20 pound weight vest that's ergonomically suited so that it's dispersed evenly above back and shoulders and and front. Um, Yesterday was a blustery conditions here. Um, I didn't really feel like working out. I, I lifted the day before, so I wasn't ready to lift in the gym. What I did is I put on my backpack and I did a 30-minute walk up a 15-degree incline in the gym on the on the treadmill, listening to a podcast. Walked eight minutes backwards, turned around, walked seven minutes forwards. And so walking is, it's. I just have to sell your audience as it is such a better choice than running. It mm-hmm. it is fat burning. It's completely fat burning. And people say, well, you know, I burn twice as many calories when I'm running. Well, actually you don't. And the reason for that is um most people I know, pretty much everyone you know, uh, they cannot run twice as fast as they can walk. So think about that. If you can walk a 15 minute mile, can you run faster than a seven and a half minute mile for for 30 minutes or 40 minutes? 95% of people in the country cannot do that. So if you can't even run 
twice as fast as you can walk. And running causes injury. And running is painful and, and, and discomforting. And walking is anabolic. It builds muscle. It's, it feels good. Um, you can multitask while you're doing it. You can walk with a friend and talk with them. You can listen to a podcast. Why would you not choose to walk every single time? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And I'm so with you. I actually work out. I do weights three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then I do, I walk at least five days a week minimum and do 45 minutes to an hour every single time. And then the only other thing that I do add is I do a rebounder because I think it's so good for your lymph nodes. So I have a couple of rebounders in my house and really work on those. And that gets me I, I do that more for my lymph, like moving my lymph and and so forth. But right. um, that's those are my favorite things to do. Very cool. So yeah, I just I love it, and and it's funny because I tell people all the time, like walking is the magic elixir to losing weight. If you want to lose weight, it is the magic elixir because, like you said, when you start doing running, it makes you so ravenous that you, without even knowing it you end up eating so much more because you've burned all that glycogen and then you end up getting ravenous and you eat a lot more than you think you are. And it kind of balances out. It's, 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 it's really unnerving when you start to do the math and you go, holy crap, I've been wasting years running, trying to lose weight. And I'm frustrating myself because it's not happening and I'm getting injured and I'm not getting faster. That's the other thing. People don't get faster. Whereas walking is just this magical thing that you can do, and it burns fat, um, and it and it is part of that. Um, by the way, if if uh, if you're somebody who's who's caught up in like in your house, and there's too many snacks in your house, and it's the middle of the afternoon, and you and you're hungry, and you're trying to you're trying to develop metabolic flexibility, which you partly develop develop by withholding food for longer periods of time. The best thing you can do when you're hungry, leave the house and go for a walk. Go for a twenty minute walk. Instead of eating a snack, and your body will start to burn fat, and the energy levels will rise up again, and it'll be fine. So walking is also, um, you know, it's sort of a, a cure for the munchies, if you will. It's so good, and even at work. So for me, all of our meetings, if I need to meet with somebody at the office, every meeting I do is walking outside. So I just say, bring your paper. I have a little paper that I do, and we yeah. walk. All my calls that I do. Every yep. call that I do, I just head right outside and go for a walk. There you go. There you go. So, well, you have decided to change the way people are walking by developing a walking shoe. And you sent me a pair of them and I absolutely love them. So tell me, what made you decide to develop shoes? Well, first of all, as a runner, I was never satisfied with the footwear that was provided to me. Even the early days of Nike and the cushion shoes. Uh, which enabled me to do a lot more miles, but then all it did was uh, push the injuries further up the body. Uh, so I got knee injuries and hip injuries as opposed to foot injuries, just from these these high tech running shoes. So I never really liked the running shoes. Um, I always liked going barefoot, but you know can't go barefoot on pavement, concrete, glass, marble, tile, hardwood floors. Everything around us is a hard surface except carpeting. So and then dress shoes. I hated dress shoes. I mean, I would get. Um, my feet would get cramped within 10 minutes of putting on a fashionable a fashionable shoe. My, my wife made me go get some um, Tom Ford shoes a couple of years ago. We were going to a high-end wedding in the south of France. I got these shoes. Um, I wore them for the wedding that day. Um, I literally, on the way home, walked barefoot and threw the shoes away. And these were really freaking expensive shoes. I'm like, this, this is not who I am. This is not what I'm doing. So anyway, I've been... Uh, I was an early adopter of the minimalist footwear movement. I want I want people to understand that your feet are the most important connection you have to the ground in your life. I mean, everything you do starts with your connection, your contact with the ground. Uh, your balance uh, depends on your proprioception, on, on how you uh, 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 feel the ground surface underneath you and the changes in terrain. Uh, your mobility, your ability to walk from here to there, to to to, to walk to your car to drive someplace, to hit the gas pedal, to you know, to be able to get on a, a plane and fly to some other country and do a walking tour. Walking is the most important, one of the most important things that humans do, and feet are the critical component of that. And most people's feet hurt. 
people that have bunions, they have plantar fasciitis, they have Achilles short Achilles issues, Achilles tendinosis, Achilles tendinitis. They got Morton's neuroma. They got neuromas just from their diabetic neuropathies. People have horrible feet. And this is the thing that you are depending on to get you through life. Like every sport you play starts with your contact with the surface. If you're hitting a baseball, if you're if you're shooting a basket, if you're swinging a golf club, all if you're bowling, all these things start with your feet. So why then would people be willing to encase their feet in narrow, restrictive coffins and then strap a pillow underneath, a, put a cushioning device underneath that that cuts off all sensation of the of what the ground feels like underneath them and spend their lives doing this and thinking it's good for them. It is. It is, it's just, it's idiotic to me. It's, it's, it's beyond comprehension. And it's all, a, it's all a factor of the, of the running shoe industry having created this sort of context of high, high the concept of, of high tech running shoes so that you could go out and run more. And we just had a discussion about how running is not the best way to, to achieve health. Um, and that's why I'm writing a whole book on why it's not and promoting walking as the best thing a human being can do, but walking in the appropriate footwear. So in your shoes, which I, which we said to you, that the Paluva strand, you have the strand model. That yeah. is is for you to, every time you walk outside, your toes should splay and grab the, and so when you push off on the big toe, you should feel your entire foot grabbing the pavement and it should bring a smile to your face. It should feel like, oh my God, these feet actually do work. They actually do feel the ground. They actually are doing something. I'm improving my 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 balance. I'm improving my strength because normal restrictive shoes, they're so confining that people have atrophied feet. Their big toe is scrunched up against the rest of their the, the other toes. Their little toe, in in many people I look at the the little toe, has shriveled up as if it's going to fall off. It's it's become completely like. On a vestigial organ, un, unused anymore. That's not right. You, we, we have to regain access to our feet. You know, imagine trying to do a handstand with oven mittens on or something, right? Um, so, or imagine trying to play a, uh, you know, a piano concerto with, with mittens on. That's what we're trying to do with our feet. Our feet are that important to us. So, my son and I designed this new type of shoe. The company's called Peluva. It's a five-toed shoe. I hope you'll agree with me that it's pretty attractive. In other words, the, the old ones were kind of like, you know, clunky and funky. And and I and I was an early adopter and I wore those old ones for 15 years. And I had 25 pair of them in my closet, but they wouldn't update the styles or the fashions. They wouldn't add a little bit of extra padding. You know, we have a little bit of like three millimeters of extra cushioning underneath. So, you, so I can walk 10 miles on pavement in these and feel like I'm walking barefoot on a putting surface. Um, and it feels good. I can walk on the gnarliest, trail with rocks and craggy sharp stuff sticking out and it feels like a massage on my feet when i step on these uneven surfaces uh and so we want to change the way the world looks at walking we want to change the way the world walks we want people to regain foot health so we're we are realigning feet with the big toe being the most important what they call it the great toe but the big toe being the most important aspect of of that foot health realigning it um strengthening it uh, and then and relaxing it because you want you want your feet to be relaxed and you want them to be comfortable all the time, not just when you take your shoes off and and you know put your feet up to rest and and massage your feet because they've been stuck in nasty shoes all day. That's I, I, it. Just blows my mind that that the world has adopted the types of shoes that it has when it this sort of new look at foot health is so available. We're calling foot health the new sleep, right? Foot health is the new sleep. Well, I had a friend, this was a great post. I need to try to find it because they said, they made a post and they said, you know, I needed a new pair of shoes. And my first thought, they, they were a runner and they said, I need new shoes. And my first thought was I need the maximum cushion that I could possibly have because that would put minimal stress on my knee. And he said he started reading some different articles that it actually would be the opposite for your knee, the more cushion it had. And he's like, he kept buying the Hoka's and the yes. crowd with these massive, massive cushions. And then he said, I finally decided to get a more minimalistic shoe and my knee problems actually were so much better. And I think that that is, you know, really what's so important is that people are like, 
oh, more cushion, hoka, on cloud, cushion, 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 because that's going to help my knees. And really, you actually want your feet need to grip the ground. And that is going to help you yourself be able to learn how to bend the ankle, how to bend the knee. And so, you know, I have a lot of problems with my hips. I feel like my hips are always a little bit out of alignment. And so whenever I go to the chiropractor, he's always like, oh, your hips are out of alignment again. And I've been wearing the shoes for the last, you know, four days or so. And I absolutely love them. And what I've realized is my hips are not there. It's actually putting them back in alignment. The more cushion. So when I wear heels and when I wear these cushiony type shoes, that's what's pulling my hips out of alignment. And by me wearing these shoes, it's I don't need to go to the chiropractor because it's almost realigning my hips back to where they need to be. And here's anything like that. We're we're hearing this all the time. Uh, People are reporting back amazing transformations, a a lot of it from walking. In other words, by getting out and walking, you are realigning your body if you walk in in this type of shoe. um, Because let's explain to your audience that the, the amount of cushioning, the, the distance from your heel to the ground is less than one centimeter in these shoes, which is not a lot. It's just like, you know, a third of an inch. But there's enough cushion there to absorb the shock of of walking gracefully from heel, because you land when you walk, you do land on your heel, which you go off on the big toe, um, and and using the small muscles of your feet and rebuilding the arch. By the time you wait... The front part of your foot in a stride. So you, 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 your foot is out in front of you. Your right foot's out in front of you. The right heel lands. And by the time you roll over it and weight that foot, the brain should know exactly what's happening underneath. The only way the brain knows is by feeling the ground. It feels the tilt of the ground. It feels the shape of the ground. It knows whether there's a rock underneath. Um, and in so, and with this information, that's the brain telling the foot how to flex sideways if need be, or forward and back, how, the knee how to bend, the hip how to torque, uh, all the muscles of the uh, of the leg how to absorb the shock. And every footfall, your brain should have that information. Regular shoes bypass all that information. A thick sole with stiff sidewalls or stiff like hiking boots, you can't feel anything underneath you. It's, you're, it's like you're wearing stilts and clop, clop, clopping up the trail. In our shoes, you want to feel the ground underneath. And I tell people, we do these events that that we're opening a couple of running shoe stores and we're getting runners to train uh, in our shoes by walking. Don't run in our shoes, just walk in them and strengthen your feet that way. Then when it's time to run, go buy your running shoes, whatever. You'll you'll put on your running shoes. But spend your day in Palooza training your feet passively. So we have these events, we call them Wednesday Walk and Wine. And we provide wine, a glass of wine, and you put on the Palooza and you go for a walk. And in the in, and these are the first time people have been wearing the shoes, and we encourage them to step on manhole covers and feel the different surface of the metal underneath, or step on those step on those like knurled buttony uh, uh, metal grates that they have on the road. S- step sideways on a on a curb, whatever, and feel your foot flexing and feel the toes hitting uh, at, at a different time. We want the toes to go up and down as they're walking. We, if you step on an uneven surface and the front part of your foot is on a small rock and it and it depresses your toe up in the middle. You want that to happen. You want to feel that. All of that stuff is good. It's not like it's a bad thing. It's all a good thing. It's all strengthening your feet. It's all building resilience, mobility. Uh and you know that for, the idea here is that yeah, I want I want a very comfortable shoe. So our our three pillars are comfort meets function meets style. We wanted the most comfortable shoe we could create. And for me, that was but rule number one. I I've never had comfortable shoes. These are the most comfortable shoes I've ever worn, and I happen to make them. Functional. We need to feel the ground. We need individual toe articulation, and then they needed to have style. And and I have leather ones that I wear to to. I'm going to the opening of a of a big casino in Las Vegas in two days. I'm going to wear uh, a Tom Ford suit and my black leather five toe shoes. And I guarantee you. They look great, and no one will even notice that they have five toes on them, you know, individual toes, unless I call their attention and say, oh, yeah, by the way, look at my feet. Um, so we make we make shoes for all, all occasions in life, right? We make, we're make we making a, a, a house shoe. Uh, we, we make a, a moccasin that you can, uh, you know, a loafer kind of shoe. Um, 
I make we make training shoes, uh, a desert boot. Because once you understand the importance of individual toe articulation, the importance of foot health, once you appreciate the comfort that these afford, you won't want to wear regular shoes often, if ever again. Guys, I just want to interrupt for just a second, and I want you to hear Paul Saladino talk about why liver is so important. And if you don't like liver, we have another option for you. Your ancestors were eating liver. And the reason that this sort of wisdom has been passed down is because liver is very nutritious. It's basically nature's multivitamin. If you look at the nutrients in meat, they're great. You've got zinc, you got B6, you got B12, you got some K2. But if you look at liver, it really complements what's in muscle meat. And there are many unique nutrients found in organs, specifically liver as a powerhouse of these, that are difficult to obtain outside of liver. Like meat and organs are like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. They're supposed to be eaten together. The easiest way to eat liver is just to do it raw. If you don't want to eat liver raw, you can cook it. But the reason that I like to do it raw is because there are unique nutrients in liver that are probably somewhat degraded when you cook the liver. This really is like the most nutrient rich supplements that you can find. And they are amazing. I have tried them. I absolutely love them. So just go to heartandsoil.co, use the coupon code Chantal Ray and save you some money there. Well, remember when, when you know, with CrossFit and CrossFit was all the rage, yes. they were the kind of one of the people who also were talking about minimalist shoes. And when I would go to the CrossFit gym. Everybody had them. Okay, everyone had the minimalist shoes. And what they said to you was, and these are perfect for going, not just walking, but going to the gym. Because when you're going to the gym, you need to be able to feel the ground and you need to be able to have your toes help you when you're doing squats, when you're doing lunges, when you're doing leg presses. I, I wore them to the gym and I was doing the leg press. And I Lazy. could feel when I was pushing the leg press, I, my toes were helping me yes. and gripping that leg press. And I felt like I could do higher weight. You were engaging more muscles because of the feel that you had. This is, I get this from like top bodybuilders who are, who are training in Blue Um, they were, they feel like they're engaging more of the muscles in their legs because all of the toes are connected up, up the foot and through the leg to other tendons and ligaments and muscles further on up the kinetic chain. So it makes total sense that you would engage even more muscles. And if you engage more muscles, you recruit more muscle fibers, you're able to lift more weight. Now I'm not guarantee, I'm not gonna guarantee you have buy my shoes and you can lift more weight. But that's sort of what ha is happening is that you're getting this, this proprioceptive, this haptic sense, I should say, of uh, uh, your feet being the origination of a kinetic chain that goes all the way up the body. But you have to have that first origin. You have to have that connection with the surface against which you're pressing. And you have to realize like your toes are have muscles and you want to build your toe muscles as well. And that these shoes give you the toe freedom, the toe articulation, and you being able to feel the ground underneath you is really magical. Absolutely. No, it's it's a whole different sensation from what people are used to. And I think <laughs> you see the internet, uh, those internet memes of the baby who can't, who's deaf, and then they put the cochlear implant and, you know, and they hear their parents' voice for the first time, and you see the look in their face. Uh -huh. I mean, it's it's not quite like that, but it's the same sort of thing. But my whole life, I've been wrapped up in these. I've been cased in these nasty shoes that are squinching my toes together. I have bunions because of the fashionable footwear that I wear, or I have plantar fasciitis, largely as a result of pushing my big toe against the rest of my foot. Now I put on these shoes, and oh my god, if I I want to walk. I don't fear walking anymore because my feet hurt. I want to walk because it feels good, and I feel compelled to want to walk. It's a whole different sensation. It's funny because I have two of my friends that both have had um, a lot of problems with bunions and plantar fasciitis. And there's, I mean, they there's so many people who have so many foot problems. And these are, you know, the one thing that the, the guy said to her, because um, she was always wearing flip-flops mm -hmm. with like, these big cushiony things. And he was like, those flip-flops with those big cushions, that is what has really caused your plantar fasciitis and to the point where she had to end up getting 
uh, foot surgery. That first one. Oh, I hate to, hate to hate do that. You had to get a second one. Hate so, to hate that. Because the first one didn't work. That's always the other thing too, right? You had multiple surgeries because the first one didn't take. It, and and this is a case where I almost guarantee you she didn't need it. You know, it wasn't it wasn't something that that needed to be corrected. But the most a lot of the podiatrists, you know, are are still of the nature that they need to use surgery to fix plantar fasciitis, uh, bunions, um, Achilles issues, and things like that. When really what you need to do is rather than put a band aid on it. Like people who have uh, plantar fasciitis, a lot of people would say, well, I'll just get an orthotic and I'll just, I'll, I'll support my arch and then my pain will go away. Well, the pain might go away a little bit, but it doesn't fix the problem. The problem is that your big toe is scrunching against the rest of your feet and it's cutting off the circulation to your plantar fascia. And and you're, so you don't even have an itis, you have an osis, the death of that tissue. Um, and that's a result of lack, lack of circulation. Open up the big toe give it that abduction that it's supposed to be doing and circulation reaccesses that area. You, you, you gain circulation again and you can improve the health of that plantar fascia to the point that you don't need to roll it out every day. You don't need to wear an arch support anymore, but you have to do, you know, you sort of have to address this as what is causing the problem, not so much what can I do to keep doing what I'm doing without pain and as a result, you know, put a Band-Aid on what needs to be a much more aggressive solution of trying to fix the the origin of the problem. Yeah. Now, I will tell you, I love these shoes. Um, for me, the one thing you guys have to do is make sure you get multiple pairs of socks because you, I, I got the shoes and I got one pair of socks and I was like, well, the second day I was like, I'll just wear these again because I didn't wash them. And then uh, the third day, I was like, I'll just wear these hip gloves again. So make sure you buy multiple pairs of socks because you need the the toe socks to go with the shoes. So that's my one piece of advice. And I love them. I The first day I wore them, after about eight hours, I was like, okay, I feel like my toes need a little bit of a break. The next day, I wore them for about nine hours. And then I was like, my toes need a little bit of a break. But they're super comfortable. I absolutely love them. And I mean, I think any shoes after you wear them for nine hours, you're like, I mean, who wears shoes for? Who wears shoes? Who wears shoes? I'm the shoe guy, and I don't wear shoes for nine hours. Right. I go, yeah. I go barefoot in the house as much as I can. Look, the whole reason I I I made these shoes was so that I have something to to get the barefoot feeling going outside. But when I'm home, I go barefoot. Right. That's that's the ideal solution is to go barefoot. Yeah. But you know, the practical application of that, obviously, with everything around us, um, you know not getting admitted to a restaurant being one of them uh, for, for having bare feet, right? Uh, so yeah, so the Paluma is the solution to, you know, having, uh, re reaccessing, realigning the big toe, uh, rebuilding foot strength, regaining uh, mobility and resilience in your feet, and uh, hopefully increasing longevity because, you know, if you're able to move more throughout your life, they say, you know, exercise is the great panacea, the, great, the, the greatest drug you could have for longevity is exercise. Well, if your feet are preventing you from exercising, that's a big issue, especially if you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s, right? If you want to get out there and, and continue to be uh, mobile. Um, I was I was at my dermatologist this morning and he's 82 years old and he's, you know, he's a little hunched over, but we talked about he goes to the gym every day and I said, you know, you stop moving, the decline is awfully fast after that point. So you do not stop moving, right? You got to move. And walking is the single best easiest, most accessible type of movement you can do as long as you walk in the right kind of shoes. Yeah. And I will tell you, you guys use my coupon code Chantel Ray for an amazing discount. And I think the biggest aha for me was when my hips felt like they were more aligned after wearing those shoes. That was a game changer for me. So you guys have to check them out. I wanted you to also talk a little bit about your Primal Health Coach Institute. Are you, tell people a little bit about that. So we've had, um, I started this 10 years ago and I started it when um, enough people came to me and said, God, Mark, you've written, you know, I've written 10 books on diet and exercise and health. Um, the first being the Primal Blueprint, um, but also written on keto and intermittent fasting and all manner of, of training. Um, and people would say, well, I wish I knew what you knew, Mark. And so I created a a, cert a certification, a primal blueprint certification. So many people did that certification and said, 
oh my God, like we could use this to make a career. Like I could build a career as a health coach. So we created the Primal Health Coach Institute. Um, and it is, if you just Google Primal Health Coach Institute, you'll see it is, we've had, I think 5,000 people go through the program. It's a very aggressive program. We've, we've had MDs uh, and chiropractors and you know physicians assistants and all manner of medical professionals go through the course and say it's the single best course they'd had in the medical field. I've had doctors rearrange their entire medical practice around the information in this course. Um, it is, uh, it's a, it takes about a minimum of six months to complete. It's all online. So it's a, there's 15 modules. You have to, you have to pass each module to graduate, to get onto the next module. So you have to prove your proficiency. Um, it is, I can't speak highly enough about it. I've, I've been involved in a number of other coaching programs. I was on the faculty of IIN, which is the largest one in the, in the country. We've had a lot of IIN graduates come over and take our program and say, okay, we finally, now we know what to do and how to build, how to build a business. So we have, most of it is information on diet and exercise and how to coach a client to become, uh, you know, to, to extract from that client all of the answers that are, that are unique to that person because everyone is different right? Everyone is different. So this is not a dogmatic program. This is how you as a coach can become the scientist to figure out what's going to work for your client or yourself or your family or whoever it is. A lot of our, our um, um, graduates have started their own uh, you know, personal training, personal coaching institutes or, or you know, client bases. Many are working for doctor's offices where the doctor says, okay, here's my seven minutes. You know, you know, Here's your blood work. You need to eat better and you need to work out more. Okay, well, what is it? What does a patient do with that? No, go to next door and see uh, you know, my physician's assistant. She will spend an hour with you on your first, um, you know, your the first section of how we can go through and rearrange your life so you can eat better and work out more. I'll maybe start with going to your house, cleaning out your pantry and your and your refrigerator. Maybe take you shopping and show you how to buy stuff. Maybe take you to a restaurant and show you how to order off of any menu and 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 not be. Uh, like a deer in the headlights because you're trying to stick to a program. Um, we have business building aspects, how to build a business. Um, certainly, uh, a lot of it is the psychology of how to be a coach and how to ask the right questions. It's it's an incredible course, and I'm uh, very proud of it. And and I, you know, we've we've got a lot of amazing graduates who have said wonderful things about it. And so, um, again, it's the Primal Health Coach Institute. All right. Well, one more question. I. It's funny because I went to this health mastermind. We all met in Atlanta. It was just a whole bunch of big names. It was like Ben Greenfield, Dr. Josh Axe, Dr. Z, Dr. Pampas, like this big health mastermind. And we were all at True Food Kitchen and having dinner. And um, everyone was supposed to go around and say what was their like favorite hack, you know, like as far as like, like name your top three favorite hacks. And everyone went around and everyone was like, the cold plunge, the cold plunge, ice bath, ice bath. They were just after one after another after another. So if you had, it was everyone. And then finally everyone was like, okay, when you share, you cannot say cold plunge. Yeah, yeah. You can't say ice bath. So tell us like, what would be your top three? Like if you kind of had some of the biohacking things that everyone's talking about, what's kind of your top three things that you're doing to just thrive as you get older? Okay, so I, you know, obviously, obviously, number one is walking. The more walking you do, the better off you are, uh, within reason, right? So, um, walking number one, sleep. Uh, again, it's it's. It, I get nine hours of sleep a night, and I don't apologize for that. It is absolutely restorative to me. So, walking and sleep, and then I would say, um, you know, it's the it's the things that you give up in your diet. So, so eliminating sugars and seed oils would be a combined hack number three. If you, you're 80% of the way where you need to be in your diet, uh, maybe not in a weight loss program or whatever, but certainly in, in rearranging your health, uh, your risk factors for lifetime disease and things like that, eliminating seed oils and getting rid of sugar would be hack number three. I love it. Well, this was so inspirational, Mark. It really was. And I just aspire to be more and more like you. I feel like I just am so aligned with everything you say and not just your knowledge, but just your view of life and just the way that you enjoy your family, you enjoy your life. And I just love, love, love everything you do, even with Primal Kitchen and just getting rid of all those seed oils out of the salad dressings and really making great products. So 
Thank you so much for your time today and everything that you're doing to really take people's health to the next level. I just, I just appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight to be here. Yes. Well, you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now.